It's about time I had authentic conversations about conversations I avoid. Acacia, thorny conversations. There were those days in school when the teacher would give you your quiz papers or your exam papers. Of course, I, I loved teachers who, who gave you papers with the mark side written down, showing downwards. It, served, it saved you the indignity of people seeing your poor marks. But there was one word you, teachers normally would score you and your score would be up there, so whether it's 13 out of 100, and then there'd be a comment there, either very poor or good or very good. But one comment we all feared was, see me. Just those two words, see me. It was enough to make you begin feeling unwell. Because you knew the moment you see those two words, you're about to have a very difficult conversation and that that difficult conversation would translate into probably a very difficult day. Hi, my name is Saya, and I want to invite you to a journey where we will have an authentic series of conversations. I call this journey acacia. Just like the African tree, the acacia tree has lots of thorns, and in life we have many funny conversations. Few people take naps under acacia trees because of the risk of running into thorns. And similarly, many of us avoid thorny conversations. Acacia is the acronym for authentic conversations about conversations I avoid. I've deliberately used the word conversation there twice to indicate that I need us to be able to focus on these conversations we avoid. Through this series of programs, my idea is to be able to talk about things that I find uncomfortable, and you probably also find uncomfortable. As a Christian and as a believer, there are probably things you see, you observe, you've probably thought about, but you avoid for a number of reasons. Maybe they are uncomfortable, or maybe they're not the prominent things. Have you thought about how your religion permeates every other area of life? Or have you just held it to yourself? What about struggles like pornography, alcoholism? What about social issues like suicide and things like unemployment and poverty? How do these translate to the Christian? And if you're in that situation, how do you deal with it? These are not conversations you will hear or we've often heard from the pulpit but this represent the reality of life as you and I experience it on a day-to-day -day life. But for today, I want to ease us in on the dynamics of difficult conversations. Not just because that's a whole series, but because it is also skills that you will need for day-to-day -day life. Life constitutes very many difficult conversations and many powerful discoveries either about self or society or just life as a whole lie at the end of difficult conversations. They do not sit on this end of easy and comfortable things. It, it took men to have very difficult conversations for us to have aeroplanes or vaccines or many of the things that we have. It takes companies to have difficult conversations for them to be able to understand what market they need to play in. And often, it takes very difficult conversations for the sinner to realize their need for Christ and for them to be able to turn around. But why is it that we avoid difficult conversations? It is largely because of the constitution of difficult conversations. So let me go back. When I get my exam paper and it's written there, see me. Already I'm preparing for a difficult conversation. When you go in and the teacher will probably ask you something like, hey, sire, why are your marks like this? And you already begin either defending or apologizing and there's something happening in the teacher and there's something happening in you. And as the two of you interact with each other, the conversation becomes exceedingly difficult. But what if, what if we could 
pause and prepare the teacher for the conversation? What if I, as a student, walking into this otherwise un unpleasant interaction could be better prepared to hold this conversation? Wouldn't we probably have made more? The teacher is in that situation because he or she wants my academics to improve. I am in school because I want to get going with school, I want to get good grades, I want to go to the next level, I want to become better, I want to probably get a good job. Both of us are in that situation wanting terminally great things, but this individual respective situation, which is a bridge to that, we do not know how to handle it. And so, when mismanaged, I may end up leaving that conversation hating my teacher, or the teacher hating me, or building an attitude towards me, or I still, maybe I could end up hating the teacher's subject, because I begin um, thinking their subject to be synonymous with a difficult conversation. But really, that difficult conversation is difficult because it is three conversations in one. Difficult conversations are difficult because they really are three conversations in one. Number one, a difficult conversation has the what happened part of the conversation. The what happened conversation, we normally deal with facts, okay? What happened, I gave you, a, I gave you an exam, you got 13%. That's, that's what happened from the teacher's perspective. But what happened from my perspective may be very different. I may have read and she just did not, in my view, I feel she did not bring on the areas I read or in my view, she may not have taught well in the areas that I did not do well. So what happened from my perspective and what happened from her perspective are very different. So already you can see, right from the get-go, we're on very different footings in this conversation. And it's going to be difficult because the component number one is the what happened. The challenge with the what happened conversation is something we call intention. The teacher does not really know my intention. And I really don't know the teacher's intention. And so I guess, and so she also guesses my intention. And this is a bit normal human behavior. When we often are guessing people's intention, we guess the best about ourselves, but we guess the worst about others. So component number one of difficult conversations is the what happened. Number two is the identity conversation. When we are having a difficult conversation, you're continuously thinking subconsciously, and at times maybe not too subconsciously, what does this say about me? So I got 13%. What does this say about me? Am I a fool? Will it, will it mean that I will never amount to anything? Meanwhile, the teacher is also thinking the same. What is this saying about me? Am I a bad teacher? Am I being too strict on this student? What, all of us are sitting in that room and unconsciously at the back of our minds, we're having a separate conversation about what does this say about us? And when that becomes a case, both of us are quick or eager, consciously or unconsciously, to safeguard our identity. We don't want to come out badly, and so we do things like lying or conniving or shutting ourselves down, just so that we can try to protect ourselves, or we come out angry to try and protect the other person from coming in too deep. And so what makes a difficult conversation difficult, number two, is the identity part of the conversation. The um, third component that is closely tied to the motives is what next? What's going to happen next or the consequence bit of it? We want to begin thinking about, so what will happen next? What is going to happen? And we are always in this mode of trying to mitigate. So I got 13%. Does this mean I'm going to retake? Will I, my parents be told? What's going to be the consequence about all of this? Will, I, will it affect my eventual grade? Will I come down? Is the teacher going to include this? And so the teacher is also thinking, will my supervisor see this? Will they be able to interrogate this student? And everyone is thinking about it at the same time. Now, that conversation broken down, which happens between me and the teacher in the staff room, plays itself in many other areas of life. When you disengage from thinking about unemployment, or when you're hiding about suicidal thoughts, when you're really thinking about your unemployment and what does God have to say about it, but you're quiet and it's affecting your spirituality, what you're really going through is a difficult conversation. When you're hiding pornography, you're probably having a very difficult conversation because you're thinking, what does this say about me? 
identity. What happened? How did I get to here? Which is how, what is my motive and what will other people think about my motives? And how do I get out of this? What's the consequence of this? All of those three things are happening at a go and it's making many of the discussions we need to voice out kept in. The reason you're not seeking help for some, with somebody about your suicidal thoughts is because already in your head you've played out that entire scenario and you're thinking, man, when I talk to this person, will they judge me? How will my identity come across? And this series, we want to peel back the mask and begin confronting difficult conversations. And why I am bringing out these things in advance is to be able to say, I understand, I get it. I have difficult conversations I'm avoiding. You have difficult conversations you're avoiding. But we are not the first. The Bible opens on the premise of a very difficult conversation that took part in Genesis chapter 3. The Bible says from verse 5, of the book it says and when the man and, and when the woman saw that fruit that it was good for food and pleasing to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise she did take of the fruit and did eat it and gave some to her husband with her and he did eat and their eyes were both opened and they realized that they were naked and the man and his wife sewed fig leaves together and they made aprons for themselves and in the cool of the day they had the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden and Adam and his wife hid from the presence of the Lord in the midst of the trees. And the Lord God spoke to them and said, Adam, Adam, where art thou? And the man answered and said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I hid myself because I was naked. And the Lord said to him, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the fruit of which I commanded thee, saying thou mayst not eat thereof? And the man answered and said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she did give me some of the fruit, and I did eat it. And the Lord asked the woman, What is this that thou hast done? Has thou eat, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman answered and said, The serpent, he did beguile me, and I did eat. Already you see, from the moment mankind fell into sin, God comes to have a conversation with him, but it turns out to be a very difficult conversation. Testimony of that is the question number one, when a man is asked a question in geography, and he answers it in psychology. He's asked, where are you? That's a geography question, and he says, I heard your voice and I heed. That's a psychologist explaining his feelings. God didn't ask him, how are you feeling? He asked him, where are you? And he answers it very difficult. It's because from the moment sin kicked in into our society, the whole paradigm of difficult conversations began. And please notice, when you read it in Genesis 3, you realize difficult conversations from the get-go made man hide or run away from God. It's been that way from when we fell. It is that way until now. I'll be upfront. One of the things I'm thinking with this series is just making you think more about your spirituality and thinking about your walk with God or your connection to God if it does not exist and which many times it has been affected because of the avoidance of difficult conversations. What do we do when we are avoiding difficult conversations? The, the text in Genesis 3 is very interesting. Number one, Adam hides behind something. He gets aprons of leaves and hides behind trees. So very often in our bid to run away from difficult conversations, we hide. We create things and we hide behind them. In the case of Adam, it was fig leaves, aprons, hiding behind trees. In our cases, we hide a lot behind masks. The masks of smiles, the masks of anger, the masks of positions. But just observe very carefully what a mask in life does, and even this mask that Adam generated did. The Bible says Adam made aprons. That word is important, he made aprons. In a bid to avoid a difficult conversation, he hid in an apron. Now, aprons are known for what they do not hide. Aprons leave the arms exposed. Of course, they leave the face and a lot of the chest exposed. They leave large portions of the thighs all the way to the legs totally exposed. And of course, aprons leave everything from head to toe and the posterior completely exposed. But you understand, the stature of Adam, he was such a big man, for him to be able to pluck enough fig leaves to make coverings for himself was a lot of hard work. So granted, our Efforts to avoid difficult conversations involve a lot of work 
and a lot of hard work for that. But the normal result is exactly what Adam achieved, an apron. The product that is of a lot of hard work but barely covers or addresses the need. Same thing, you may call it apron, you may call it a mask, but whichever the name or the attitude you give to it, you realize it requires a lot of work to come up with it. But even when we have covered ourselves with it, barely covers the need. It still leaves things exposed. You still go to bed with those questions and those longings and those existential problems that keep on going in your mind. So approach number one that we use to avoid hard questions is the approach of aprons or masks or things we try to hide. So insufficient was it that when God came up and began asking things, Adam hides behind trees. He realizes, hey, wait a minute, my, my apron is not enough. I need, it needs backup. I need trees to hide. He, he, he tries to blend in. He's in fig leaves trying to hide behind trees. It's curious how in our sinful mind we imagine that God will not figure us out. The God who created everything will not be able to figure out and say, hmm, there's a tree there that's part human and part fig leaf. Hmm, it's not in the right place. But somehow in our bid to avoid critical, transformative, difficult conversations, we try to blend in. Masks are able to do that. They make us look like we fit in. But behind, when Adam spoke, he still said, I'm afraid. And then approach number two, Adam says it this way. When God asks him, hey, where are you? He says, hey, the woman you gave me. And when the woman is asked, what have you done? She says, ah, the serpent. All of them were doing something very human in avoiding difficult conversations. It is at the basic level they were coming up with a philosophy. At the more English level, they were blaming. They were blaming every other thing, but ultimately they were blaming God. But really, what they were doing here is opposing a very sophisticated um, philosophical argument. They were basically, in essence, Adam was saying, God, the woman whom you made is the one who's beguiled me. So look, God, technically, this is something between you and the woman. And the woman is saying, God, philosophically, what's happening here is the serpent did, made me do this. So this is something you and the serpent need to sort out. They're putting forward a philosophical argument. It may not be the most sophisticated, but it is still one nonetheless. And often, when we are desperate to avoid difficult conversations, what we do is exactly what Adam and Eve do here. We come up with philosophies, some of them very sophisticated, some very not sophisticated. But at the end of the day, what the philosophies do is they blame everything and everybody else except ourselves. The Bible will later on come and say our weapons are mighty for bringing down um, thoughts and holding captive minds and ideas. So the Bible recognizes that the things we fight with are not just spiritual. Some of them are also in the thought realm, in the mind realm that need to be brought into harmony. And so in a bid to avoid difficult conversations, many of us will come with arguments, with philosophies, with all this manner of things that blame God, blame other people, but don't blame us. But look at the result. Adam still says and admits, even while saying those things, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Philosophy may at times attempt to meet the mental need, but there is a deeper human need than that. So the philosophy may argue at the mental entirely level, but then there are deeper existential struggles which avoidance of difficult conversations and engagement with God through the use of philosophy, cannot satisfy those deeper longings. And Adam admits by saying, they still are hollow in me. Even if I'm arguing this way, I am still afraid. I'm still naked. When you read the rest of the text of Genesis chapter 3, God does something very great. He does not walk away from the difficult conversation. He engages with it because he knows the solution, the transformation, the emancipation, the growth happens at the other end of the difficult conversation. You need to go through the difficult conversation. You need to go through it authentically. 
you need to be able to go through it genuinely so that people can be able to receive the results on the other end. And that is why beginning with the serpent, he says, and to the serpent he said, because thou hast done this, cast thou above all creatures of the ground. On the belly shalt thou crawl all thy days, and dust shalt thou leak. And I'll put enmity between thee and between the seed of the woman, and he will crush your head, and you will bruise his heel. And unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and anguish. In sorrow and anguish shalt thou bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be towards your husband, and he will rule over you. And unto the man he said, Because thou hast done this, and hast hearkened to the voice of thine wife, and eaten of the fruit of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou mayst not eat thereof. Cast is the ground for thine sake. In toil and in labor shalt thou eat. From the sweat of thy brow shalt thou eat bread, until thou return to the dust. For dust art thou, and unto dust shalt thou return. And unto the man, and unto the woman, the Lord God did make coverings of skin, and he clothed them. And the man called his wife Eve, um, and the man called the woman Eve because she was the mother of all mankind. And then continues from there. So God did not walk away because people were not willing to engage in this difficult conversation. I think God knew this is a thorny conversation, but he proceeded with it. You see, life has four main questions we are really trying to answer. Number one is a question of origin, where we came from, meaning, why am I here? Morality, how do I tell right from wrong while I am here? And destiny, when it is all said and when it is all done, what, what is going to happen next? And God has an answer for all of those things. So when you're trying to look for an answer to life, you could be an atheist, you could be a Scientologist, you could be an animist, you could be a Muslim, you could be whatever it is. What you need to ask yourself is, that thing that is answering you, those four questions of life, is it coherent? Does it make sense together? And then, does it correspond to life as you know it? And so, man, in Genesis 3, is avoiding a difficult conversation because in him, those four questions are being asked. How did I come to be here? Why am I here? How do I know my right from my wrong? When it is said and done, where am I going next? That's a struggle Adam is having. And God comes and in the response he gives to the serpent and the response he gives to Eve and in the response he gives to Adam, God shows that he understands these four questions and he provides an answer that permeates every area of life. No wonder later on in Ephesians 6, Paul will open the passage about that famous passage about wearing the armor of God with these words, he says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Paul does not say there's a secular life and there's a spiritual life. Paul underscores that for the person subscribing to the biblical worldview, their life is a continuum, it is a whole, that God impacts and dictates all the area of life. So, when we are engaging with authentic conversations, what we are trying to really look is, if God and the Bible is going to be the guide of life and it is answer to origin, meaning, morality, and destiny is coherent, and also corresponds to life as we engage with it, as we know it, then surely God's word and God's way must have something to say about these difficult conversations we avoid. God's word and God's way. God must have a way for poverty. God must have a way for suicide. God must have a way for unemployment. God must have a way to deal with pornography. God must have a way with... Um, with unemployment. God must have a way with these difficult, uncomfortable conversations that we um, engage with. Otherwise, then the biblical worldview is either not coherent or the biblical worldview does not correspond to life as we truly know it. So in this series, Acacia, Authentic Conversations About Conversations I and You, 
avoid, we need to begin looking at these conversations we avoid and then be able to ask ourselves what is God's way. One thing I need to add is the brilliant thing that God's response in Genesis 3 does is you already begin seeing how he thinks and how he moves conversations. You see, we already said a difficult conversation has the what happened conversation, it has the identity conversation, and it has the what next conversation. But God steps in and begins reshaping the objective or the agenda in each of these three components of the conversation. Man is struggling with his identity. He is not too sure if now he is man or part man, part fig leaves, or part man, part fig leaves, and part a tree. But then when God comes, he still tells him, calls him man. He still calls Eve woman. He restores to man the identity question. He reassures man about the identity. So whereas God understands what's happening in the mind of the man, he makes sure that the conversation is moved from man trying to prove or show his identity and God reassures him about his identity. God arrives and asks questions. He does not come and begin, he does not judge or pass any sentence until he has listened to man. He does not come with preset motives for man. He asks the man, what have you done? Where are you? He asks the woman, what have you done? What's happening? And so God makes us realize that when we begin engaging in difficult conversations, even in other private areas of life, what we need to learn to do is not pre-assign motives, but we need to lead and learn with curiosity. And what people do when they are led with curiosity through questions is they open up about their assumptions, is that they open up about the underlying things. I think many discussions, even outside of what we are discussing about, many difficult conversations we've been avoiding in our marriages, at our workplace, in society, will be made a whole time easier if we just began leading with curiosity and not pre-assigning motives. And in the final step, when God begins showing what's the next step, he adequately describes the need, he accurately describes the need, sorry, he adequately provides for it, and he himself offers himself as a role model. When God provides skin to the naked human being, what he does is he's telling him, I understand your need is nakedness, accurately. He then adequately replaces an apron with a covering, and then he himself takes time to cover the man, role modeling for him what it is to become fully dressed. And I believe that's what God is out to do for us in this entire series. He wants to accurately describe our need, adequately provide for it, and he himself is going to be the role model. I'm excited for the journey ahead. My name is Saya, and welcome to Acacia. <laughs>